Hi, this is Brenda Luther recording a little bit about what we can do with starting task one. Um, I've just got a few windows open here on the screen and hope it's not too distracting to you. But I really wanted to show you the community because in my mind the community has a lot of things like blogs. Um, it has the, uh, the webinars for the tasks. Lots about APA getting started webinars, and I'm make you, probably making you dizzy scrolling down, but um, that's because I care a lot about this blog as well, where the study guides are. So don't forget that all these things are there for you to use as you need. But let's get to really what I wanted to show you, which is um, kind of a, a, a vision of what you're going to see as a Word document. I've simply taken the task instructions from that study guide where I showed you they were loaded in those community blogs. I've taken all of my notes out of here and um, all the comments and put it together. So A1, I've, I've formatted it so it looks like a paper that you're really going to write and start with. So this is kind of what I see it look like. A1A, they want the citation of, of the piece of evidence you're going to use for part A. Uh, and so we have a, I've made a graphic that you can use. You can certainly um, use this very graphic. Take out all my comments and put in your article citation. Take my comments out. Put in your review of their background of literature. Um, again, take the comments out and put in your review of their review of literature. Put their methods, data analysis, their conclusions. And then um, analysis of these five areas. You can just use this document to uh, start writing about it, whatever you want to say. That was just gibberish that I'm saying because I'm recording and I can't multitask so I can't type and record at the same time I guess. I've also formatted this document so when so that the matrix is in landscape and your content is in um, portrait. That sometimes helps people and you can you know take my comments out of here. I would not submit this with my comments in it because they'll think well what are they doing just submitting Brenda's study guide? I would you could use them in here, but you could put Smith and Jones. You found the the journal from um, Sinall. It was published in 2012. You just tell what it is. I show you this example because this matrix you're you're inputting that brief of knowledge about the matrix. Remember the matrix and the annotation are the two major tools that we use in evidence-based practice because we have to have some way to remember these 10 pieces of evidence. You can't remember one article from the next after just three articles. So the matrix gives us a skeletal view of when it was published, where it's published, who the authors were, what kind of research they did, who their sample was, what were their major outcome variables they measured, what were their key findings, and what were their conclusions. Um, notice in this one I made this up, but I, um, their key findings were that they were timing nurses. They were ticking off how many times people in the ICU washed their hands when appropriate. And when they didn't wash it, they would say, you know, oh, they didn't wash it appropriately. What was going on? And they recorded that, and then they made a conclusion about it. And, you know, what they found is that when someone was interrupted during care, they missed hand washing. Then... Um, in the comment section, just why is that important to you? Well, whatever the knowledge is you learned, but you know, I extrapolated that the effects of interruption uh, is new knowledge and, and is valuable to us. So you just skeletally review each article and put them in each of these boxes. Then if then I would go to the annotation and do the annotation for this exact article. So the annotation, annotated style is to put a full APA citation followed by a paragraph of summary of why the article is important to your topic. Um, just summarize the article briefly. You don't have to summarize anything that you put in the annotation. So you don't have to summarize what journal it came from, what year it is, uh, what their outcomes were. You probably are going to summarize more talking about this information. What was learned new? And why is it important to the topic? So you don't have to put details in the in the matrix that you're going to include in the annotation. 
So that's what I would do for all 10 pieces of your research. Just get it scrubbed out skeletally in the matrix and then go down and write your summary annotation. Get your next article, come back up to the matrix, put it in there, and then put it in the um, annotation. And you notice this is just a word table that I did insert word table. If you want to put more rows below, you just select insert rows below and you'll get three more rows for three more articles. You want to select add some more, insert rows below. And you inserted too many, you can highlight them, delete rows. Pretty manageable. So that's a good way to start. That way you have your 10 pieces of research scrubbed in, in your head. You've got them skeletally outlined and you've got them flushed out in a narrative why they're important. Then you can start thinking of these, this group of evidence that you look at by either using your graphic or your annotations. You can think of them as one big group of knowledge to you. You've put 10 pieces together. They might have similar uh, components. They may have dissimilar components. You're going to think about you know, what did this knowledge bring to you? And that's where you can start on answering the last portions of the task. So look at the task study guide and um, you see I have a lot of the similar stuff. Now we're going to compare and contrast all these articles as a group of evidence. And B3B is your first um, section where you talk about them as a group. The word efficacy can really mean a lot of different things, but here it really means did these researchers make a case for you? Did these 10 pieces of evidence make a case? Um, do, you, uh, do you have an idea of what you want to bring to practice? What Did their recommendations make sense to you? You can also look at broad credibility as a uh, credibility issues of evidence as a group or an individually as a piece of evidence and maybe some articles are more valuable to you than others. Um, that's all a good conversation in here because the end all question you ask yourself is I've scrubbed through searching evidence now I've brought ten, uh, 10 of them together do they give me enough all knowledge am I confident in that knowledge to make a practice change? You don't have to have um, rocket science here. Just say, what did I look at? Has an overall, did they make a case? Um, so call out, you know, that maybe a group of them had similar recommendations, or one of them maybe had a disparate recommendation. While it's not discounting, maybe it's adding to, or maybe it does discount. And, and how are you going to rectify that in your mind? Then um, we want to move into the next section. The next two sections are on tools or instruments that researchers use to collect variables. That's simply what tools are. It's how we measure the variables. Um, oh, in obesity, we would do a lot, we have a lot of different tools to measure obesity. We have scales, we have MRIs, we have doubly labeled water, we have MRI, uh, we have self-report, height and weight, we calculate a BMI. They all have different accuracy. They have different uh, burden on the research participants. They have different costs. Uh, some we can collect easier than others. So you just want to say, overall, the tools used in these studies were and list them. You know, you may have had surveys that's, that researchers used. They may have uh, used similar surveys. Like if you had studies in stress and coping, there's a great stress and coping survey. Well, there's a couple of them, I guess. And some of them are the same, some of them are similar, some of them are different. They, they're just different. They just are what they are. The, how did they measure their variables? Some, some variables might have been, um, like if you've done hand washing, some variables are, might have been the presence or absence of pathogens on someone's hand. So the tools we would use to discover that are kind of the tools of basic bench science, lab science. You know, we do cultures, and um, that would be a tool how we collected that variable. So I've got a link in the study guide to a webinar on tools and instruments and uh, you can learn more about it. 
then in B3D, you're really asked to just look at, okay, these tools are different. Some are accurate, some are burdensome, um, some are precise but very costly. How could that have affected the results of the studies? Could one study be more accurate than another because of the tools they chose? That's all you have to do there. I, I say that's all you have to do. I know it's, it's harder than that. I mean, I know you're thinking and working hard on it. Then in B4, you're going to kind of stop demonstrating your competencies about summarizing and synthesi or synthesizing and critiquing and looking at tools. And you're going to step back. B4 is kind of your big overall, OK, I'm synthesizing this evidence. This is kind of like if you had all of your peers and they knew you, you got a week off to go do this evidence-based practice project on a topic and you're expected to come back now and say, okay, here's what we know, here's what I know to date. This is what you would tell your peers. You would probably group your evidence and say, you know, a majority of the evidence shows this about hand washing. Um, Smith and Jones and Clark all said this and it was very similar to what um, Evans said, and you know, you would use in-text citation. You would try to give them, here's the evidence, everything I know, everything I learned. So give this, um, you know, you don't have to have this long. You want it to be concise. Uh, group it together. Try to say, you know, the majority of my evidence was looking at what kind of pathogens were left on people's hands after washing. I had a group of evidence also about what behaviors contribute, promote, or are a barrier to people just doing hand washing. And then I had an odd article about hand washing in the field when you're not in an inpatient setting or something. Um, and you would just summarize those. Based on all that evidence now in B5, bring to bring a specific nursing strategy based on the evidence, which that means you say this so-and-so says to do this, and you think this is what we should bring to practice. The term theoretical model right here sometimes throws us, but what it really just means is our res each researcher should be suggesting to us a new model of care, a new theoretical model of care. So what did they construct for us for a recommendation or a care regime? Use in-text citations to back up your statement. So you're not saying, I think we should do this. That's not evidence-based practice. What we'd say is Smith & Jones recommends that when nurses are working one-on-one -on -one with clients, that nobody should interrupt them because if you interrupt them, you will knock off their uh, process and they might not wash their hands. Now that's pretty simplistic, but I mean, that's kind of an expanded version of a strategy based on evidence. Then the last section of B is um, just recognizing what theory and theoretical models do for us in research, not just re nursing research or healthcare research, any type of research. We really are researching a theory, a construct of knowledge that we know that's proven now. So Hauser can help you understand what theory does for research, and I give you a few hints in here as well. And um, basically, you know, theories are frameworks, and frameworks help us anticipate what's going to happen. We all live, uh, or we function off of theories. You know, in nursing, we function off of theories every day. We function off of germ theory. We function off of developmental theory. We function off of a lot of biophysical theories of disease processes and body systems. Uh, we thought we function off of cognitive theories and learning theories. And we muddle those all together every time we interact with a client or even every time we interact with each other. So uh, don't let the word theory scare you and this and um, you know look in Hauser if you're worried about what to respond to here, but you can just give a general uh, statement uh, statements, a paragraph about paragraph or two about why theory is valuable to research. And don't forget, even though you've put these in-text citations in your annotation, you're still going to give this paper a reference list, which I'm going to flip back to my formatted paper example. And, um, you know, I have the example of the references. So I would delete all this and put my reference list here. 
you know, reference, ref, all headers are kind of center justified, so you would do that. Now, that started on B2. Isn't that odd? We should have probably just started the task there. But I feel like that helps you just focus on your evidence first and answer those questions as a group. Then you have to go back and fill in the other places, all these other sections. So B1 is identification of your nursing problem. And as I said in the study guide, you've probably looked at that. Uh, B1 is just simply about you stating your the reason you are collecting this evidence. What's your problem statement that's driving the reason you went into search? So uh, you've read 10 articles. And those, art, those authors have given you great examples of a problem statement in their, re, in their background, their introductions, their review of literature. They've, they've kind of said, you know, what's the case for this problem? Why do we need to address this problem? Use citations to say it. If you investigated something about childhood obesity, great to have a citation telling the prevalence of pri childhood obesity. Now that citation probably could or or could be a piece of other evidence or it could be a piece of your primary evidence you're using in this matrix. Um, either way, it just helps give power to your statement. You don't have to have a lot on this. A paragraph is just fine and a concise problem statement is really valuable to your reviewers because they know what you're going to be looking at. So get that problem statement in there and then jump up back to A. And in A, part A, you are really reviewing just one piece of primary original evidence on your topic. And you're doing it in detail and you're demonstrating some competencies about knowing that a research report has different sections. They have typically a background section or it's an introduction. They have a review of literature. They have methodology. They have data analysis or results, some uh, articles call it results, and conclusion or discussion. So when you look at your one article, you want to tell the reviewer clearly what that article is. So just put it in that graph. I'll go back to my paper example. Just put it, place your APA citation in there. Then review what did they do in their purpose statement or with their background their abstract. How did they present, you know, this whole problem? A background and a review of literature, but really the background introduction part, that's really where they engage you. And they, you know, tell you as much information as they can. So does, you know, when they introduced it, did, did it feel like you were reading on the topic? Have you ever read an article when the title drew you in and you're reading the introduction and then you get into it and it's not on your topic at all. It really wasn't what you were thinking it said. Well, that kind of says a lot. It's like, did, were they clear to you or did was it your misunderstanding or was, was their problem maybe not detailed enough to be really clear and engaging? Um, that's all you have to assess in there and you can do it right within this box. Then the review of literature. Be sure you know what part of the article is the review of literature versus the other parts. You don't have to say, you don't have to quote everything that was in their review of literature. You just have to say it. You know, did they give you enough to understand the variables they were going to study or the phenomenon they were going to study? Did they use a lot of citation? Did they use a lot of primary research? How many articles did they use? What did they, what kind of groups of topics did they tell you about? Then in the methodology, you want to identify whatever they told you. Um, they should tell you what their methods were, what their study methods were. They might not always be really clear, and they might say words that don't make sense to you. You can certainly, at that point in time, use Hauser. Um, Hauser's a great text to use, and I'm flashing Hauser up here quickly, but, you know, if somebody said they did a, a correlational study, I always spell correlational wrong. You can just uh, search in all chapters or all results about what correlations mean. Or you can look in the table of contents. Um, research is at measure. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's in quantitative research designs. Um, so use Hauser. Use your text to help you 
find out what methodologies are. I've got to get back to my formatted document. And that's all you're telling in this section. Did they do a quantitative or qualitative? Remember, you know, go back to um, this, the webinars where I talk about reading abstracts and understanding studies and go to Hauser. What is qualitative and quantitative? You know, those are the two major paradigms of research. Research is either one or the other, typically. And then they usually describe more. Now, I, and as I've said, the quantitative researchers are kind of uh, brazen in the fact that they just think that's all the research there is. And so that, that um, you know it's quantitative. So they don't usually say we did a quantitative randomized clinical control trial or something. Qualitative researchers are less assuming. And so they typically tell you we did a qualitative research on this. Then the data analysis is just simply how did those researchers analyze their data. They should explain to you, they should have a data analysis or a, a data procedure section where they tell you, you know, we used a uh, chi-square analysis, whatever. You don't have to know what that is. You just have to know it's a statistical data analysis process. And then what are their conclusions? Do they make sense to you? You don't necessarily have to answer that makes sense to you up there, but what overall are their conclusions? Uh, it paraphrased in your own words. What are the researchers' conclusions? In A3, you're going to analyze these five areas. And so you can briefly go back over and say, you know, the, the background was of interest to me. The type of title was appropriate. It drew me in. Um, or it was inaccurate or whatever you felt. The review of the literature was concise and, and had topics about um, childhood obesity, feeding practices, physical activity in school, things like that. Their methodology, they did a quantitative descriptive study and their data analysis, they you know, analyzed with the um, a SPSS package. They'll tell you all that stuff in the articles. And then you discuss any ethical issues that could have arisen from this research. And so you are challenged to say, you know, what what could, ha what did happen, what, what ethical issues came up, if any were mentioned, what ethical processes did they mention, the researchers mentioned, and I talk about more ethics in the study guide, so I'll flip to that. Um, you know, did you note any ethical issues? Um, did they protect, did they mention IRB or informed consent? And oftentimes, a review of the author's ethical issues is cut from publication for word count. So sometimes they just get briefly to say, we got IRB approval. Or sometimes they don't say it. They just assume. So you just assess what you see and what you think. Then they want you to talk about the type of research. So you definitely want to take your type of research into Hauser. And you can say, well, qualitative descriptive studies are like this. or Randomized control trials are like this, and you can cite Hauser. Tell, uh, demonstrate to the reviewer you know what this, what it means, um, and then they want you to say whether another another type of research might be appropriate. Here's a great time to lean back on your ten articles. You have ten articles on similar topics, not always the same questions or hypotheses, but similar. So you can look at so how someone else might have. Ha did research this research these research questions so that can be a great example and you can say you know it, it appeared appropriate to use this type of study um, but here is another way it may be more costly it may be more burdensome or you may see something that just alarms to you and you say they should have done it this way just say that let the reviewer see that you know what a type of research is and you could frame or design another method of studying that same research. And guess what? We're down to B1, and that's all of task one. So I am going to stop this recording and hope that um, I'm helping things and not confusing things. Please um, call or email. Thanks. Bye.